All right, we're launching a brand new program, Maps Performance Advanced. That's why in today's episode, we're going to talk about why everyone should train like an athlete. You're going to love this. All right. I'm excited. Yeah, this is different than we normally do, it, right? Yeah, yeah, well, normally we, uh, I think we talk about why, you know, we make the case why somebody should train a certain way, and then most of the episode is dedicated to, to that, and then you announce whatever program we're launching. But I think for the first time ever, I feel like it's necessary that we spend most of the time talking about all the details of the program because the all yeah. the different things that are in this program is probably the most I think we've ever done. We added a lot in this program that needs explanation, I think. And uh, it'll be great to kind of dive in and show people like all the the, the little things and that um, we added in to, to make it even more precise. Yeah, well, programming uh, is obviously very important, but as you get more focused on athletic performance um, and you start to get more specific, the programming becomes uh, crucial. Um, and there are th certain components of athletic training that just benefit the average person. Uh, or put differently, these are components that are missing from 99.9% .9 of workouts. And they are, because they're missing, they're, they're preventing people from achieving the kind of results uh, that they're looking for. Um, and I think that's important to talk about. Like Before we, we continue, I think it's important to make this case and We've made this case before, but it's it's especially right now it's important with this new program. And that is that looking good does not mean or guarantee that you can move good, okay? But moving good often means that you look good and you're free from aches and pains, right? So it's like when I say seeking health leads to aesthetics, whereas seeking yeah. aesthetics, you lose your health. If you're only ever focused on looking a particular way and you work out, uh, you know, and your workouts are dedicated towards that, what ends up happening over time usually is you start to reduce your ability to move in different planes. Injuries start to pop up and those start to limit your progress. But if you're always looking at my ability to move, my ability to move, how can I move in, in different planes? How can I have, you know, work on my speed and agility um, and other types of strength? Um, then the, the reflection of that tends to be in your body. You look, you start to present as someone who can move really well. Well, there's a natural balance. If you're looking for symmetry and a, and a nice physique, uh, to improving overall movement. In order to do that, you have to be balanced uh, and, and everything has to work in unison uh, for that. So, you, you know, you put the work in the work, uh, the reflection of the work will be your body and, and it's going to yes. look great. Well, when you guys are think of this, what are some of the attributes uh, from training like an athlete that are unique to that than, say, the average person who's just going to the gym and lifting to lose body fat mm -hmm. or to look better? Well, I look, I, years ago- Ability to move fast. Yeah, well, that's a, huge one. that's a big one, right? Yeah. But I'll go, I'll go to one that's even more basic because that's, I think, quite obvious for people. We'll get there. But uh, grip, strength. This is something that is- mm -hmm. so, In fact, I you know, as a trainer- this was a limiting factor with so many clients when we'd work out, like they could lift more weight with their back or they could lift more weights, but, but, but they couldn't because their hands couldn't handle it. And so they would seek out things to help them have better grip strength. Athletes, especially athletes that use a lot of grip strength, gymnasts or grapplers, this is not a problem. And our hands, uh, are, were, we evolved to have very strong hands. You should be able to grab what you could pull or what you could lift uh, across the board until you get to the absolute extreme levels, your grip strength should not be a limiting factor. Now, someone might be like, I don't care about my grip strength. Well, I, I remember years ago as a trainer, I felt the same way and I, I used wrist straps when I worked out. And then I read a study that showed that uh, wearing wrist straps or not having a strong grip changed muscle recruitment patterns in the rest of the body. Changes muscle recruitment patterns in pressing. You don't think about grip strength when you press, but the stronger your hands are, the more muscle fibers you can activate across the board. So this is a limiting factor for lots yeah. of people. And athletic, you know, athletes don't use wrist straps. You can't. No. You got to be able to grab what you can lift. No, it's interesting to think about the variability of what types of um, demands you're putting on your hands in, in terms of like if I'm going to grip a bat or I'm a, a racket, you know, different size balls, different, um, you know, objects that you're using within your sports or even grabbing somebody. Yeah, an opponent. Yeah, being able to hold an opponent, being able to push off, like uh, just that overall volume is going to like 
supersede what you're just doing in a gym occasionally. And I think that what we've learned over the years really is you always bring up the example of like mail carriers yes. and, you know, just that overall frequency of, uh, of continual demand is, mm -hmm. is going to create nice muscular, uh, definition. Yeah. It, it's funny too. Somebody who has like, um, like really, really good grip strength, they feel even stronger than sometimes they really are too, right? Like so, of course. Like you get you you can have like an okay bench, an okay squat, but if you have like that death grip and so and they grab you, ever felt someone like that? I remember my my stepdad was a yeah. a, a contractor, right? So a construction worker yeah. his whole life, strong hands, and just from hammering and tool labor work, grap, gripping, holding stuff all day long, he had the craziest. And the, I, I look back because in my head, obviously my my perception as a kid was so different. I thought he had big old arms. And I look at these old pictures, I'm like he didn't have big arms at all, but he had forearms and he had yeah. grip strength that was crazy. And so he could like, up until like high school, he could like grab me with just one hand and I could fight all I wanted to try and break free of that. And he could just comfortably sit there and it made him feel so strong and powerful. But like I said, when I look back and I think of like, you know, what could my stepdad bench press or squat? Like he wasn't even, he wasn't even that strong, but his grip strength was so strong that it made him feel like such a strong individual. This is especially yeah. true um, in the grappling sports. Um, you know, I, I experienced this all the time. Like you, you, you guys who you're much stronger than in other movements their but their grip strength was so strong. That's what connects you to the world. So when they would connect with you with their hands and you felt it, they felt like they were twice as strong as maybe they might've displayed yeah. in the gym. Now for the average person listening, like your, your grip strength is likely limiting your performance, especially on pulling movements, but in many movements. Mm -hmm. So placing a bit of an emphasis on building your hands and your strength and your grip tends to, uh, you know, contribute to gains in other areas of your body. But for athletes in particular, grapplers in particular, um, this is important. But then you have like tennis, baseball, like th there are lots of sports that you don't think grip strength is important. Yeah. But it's very important. Yeah. It's very, very important. It gives you a massive advantage too yes. when you're strong. Yes. Next would be multi-directional performance. When I list the most popular, best muscle building exercises, they all tend to move in one plane. Now, what that means is if you only train that one plane, you start to develop a big discrepancy between the strength in that plane and then the other planes that exist in the world. And it increases your risk of injury and it actually decreases your performance. There is a ratio of strength that your body allows you to have. With, there's a range of it. And if you start to move outside of that, injuries start to pop up. This is when you get the gym goer who's fit, who's strong, benches and deadlifts and overhead presses and rows and pull-ups and all that stuff. And then they go to the park, they throw a Frisbee. Oh, my shoulder, hurt my mm -hmm. shoulder. Or they have to twist real fast to grab something. Their kid looks like they're going to fall and they throw their back out. They're like, what the hell? I can deadlift 400 pounds. How did I hurt my back? Just grabbing my kid very quickly. And it's because they don't have lateral strength. They don't have rotational strength. They don't have strength in the other planes of movement. And this limits, again, limits your right. muscle building, your fat loss, it limits you. Well, this is the Achilles heel to the core five, right? Like, and I think it's important to note that because then someone might be going like, okay, well then why, why do you care about getting strong in your squat, bench, and deadlift? And so you have to understand that when you're laying the foundation for the average person, and this includes the young athlete just getting introduced to weight training or the client who wants to get in, uh, introduced to the gym, fat loss, muscle building. Those are foundational movements to build a solid foundation. Metabolically, it's going to speed your metabolism up the fastest. It's going to add the most muscle the quickest. It's going to get you strongest the quickest. But then when you talk about being complete, yeah. it's the ability to be able to, to move in different directions, to control speed, to accelerate, to decelerate, to have grip strength, to be able to move in different planes comfortably and protect yourself from getting injured. That This is the next level or the next layer to somebody who's laid a solid foundation to like the core yeah, five. Yeah, we don't live in, in a, a you know two-dimensional world or whatever. Uh, so you need to have multi-directional <laughs> performance. Now, this is obvious for athletes. I don't know. I mean, of course, sports like powerlifting or whatever, but most sports, you 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 don't have this. You're dead. Like you play soccer and you're really fast running a straight line, but you're terrible at cutting or slowing down or turning. Like you're dead. You're yeah. dead. Football done. I don't care what sport it is. Insanely dynamic and in, in demanding uh, and explosive. And so the the amount of explosivity that you have you produce is is 
definitely like limited by the amount of what you can control and stabilize and decelerate. <clears throat> and so you're only going to be as good as like that balance between those two factors. I, you know, this is another reason why I love, I love what I do and why I love sports so much because sports has all these examples of the greatest expressions of these. And when I think of like, you know, multi-directional performance, I can't help but uh, think about Barry Sanders, which I think is was oh, oh, one of the greatest uh, athletes that we'd ever seen perform on the football field. Oh, yeah. And this speaks to like his ability. Like he wasn't the most powerful. He wasn't the he fastest. Wasn't the biggest. He wasn't yeah, the he, so what was it about him? And it was his, his ability to change direction left yeah. to right. And like, so if you watch, and I'm sure the boys will put a clip up on the YouTube channel so people can actually see him moving on the field. But it His was like cuts were insane. Oh, it was, it was just, and he would be going so hard in one direction and then change their directions at the, the opposite. And to do that under control mm -hmm. without injuring yourself, staying balanced, like that ability is somebody who has incredible strength in all directions. By the way, I want to be clear too, the, to the average person listening right now, like how does that control, what, what's the value? Okay, I'm not going to be on a football field. Why, why would I even want this? Well, two things. One, if you lack this, developing this will make your body look more aesthetic because uh, it, it, you'll appear more balanced. There are muscles that get more developed than others when you're not training in, in certain planes of motion. By developing this, if it's a weakness, what you'll notice when you look in the mirror as you train this is, I just start to look better. Now, the other part is how it feels. Yes. When you are strong and balanced in multiple directions, you feel light on your feet. I want to emphasize that point the most. And I know we're kind of saying that to appease people who are in the gym to work on their aesthetics and look good and uh, all that. But also, too, we want to feel good. We want to feel like we want to come back to the gym. We want to put more work in uh, because we're so energized. We're, we feel so good. Our joints, uh, everything accounted for, like there's – you know, minimal, no pain, no restriction. Uh, but you, you just feel like, you know, you're really capable of, of a high degree of, of output in terms and of that like, feels good. It feels really good. You feel powerful, I guess is the feel, word I'm looking for. The beauty of this, by the way, is there are ways to train all this in the gym, the strength training exercises that, that attack this. And there's ways to program workouts. It does take more skill to do so. In fact, we were talking off air, when it comes to, if you're a trainer, by the way, uh, and you're you're trying to build your business, you will want programs like Maps Performance Advanced because if you ever get a client that's an athlete, a high school athlete uh, or a college athlete, but you're probably more likely to get a high school athlete, the programming in, that you need with athletes is another level. There's like strength training programming, which is higher than most people understand. Then there's athletic programming training, which is on another level. And there are ways to train the body to develop all this stuff. Next up is just moving fast. You've already talked about this a few times yeah. in this podcast, but the ability to quickly exert strength there, this is the real world. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you're going to lift heavy things slowly, but think of all the times you've had to move out of the way or you stepped off a curb or you got to grab something or you got to be able to exert this strength in a way that also involves speed. This is a skill. And if you don't train it, mm -hmm. then this actually becomes a detriment. This is such a powerful skill that this takes me back to like when I was playing sports as a kid and the the kids that were the best athletes in in whatever sport weren't always the best at the, the skill of that sport. They were just faster than everybody else. Mm -hmm. If you build that attribute, it's such a strong attribute that it a lot of times will make up for the lack of skill in something yeah. like being so explosive, so fast. And I, you know, I remember teaching kids this when I was, you know, a young trainer and teaching young athletes that, you know, wanted to get better at their sport. And I'd be like, man, if you just spend time be being the fastest kid on the court, the fastest kid on the field, like you, you can make up for the fact that you may not be the most skilled or the yeah. biggest or the strongest because you're the fastest speed carries over to so many sports. All You'll sports. have the most opportunities to make a play and yeah. whether or not you make the play is what you would fine tune all those other uh, skills and practice. But uh, to have speed uh, gives you a massive advantage uh, to your opponents and also like your teammates, like you will shine if, and this is really a characteristic that coaches are looking for more so on pretty much much all levels of sports is in, in excel to the ability to accelerate uh, and put yourself there before everybody else uh, is is definitely a desirable thing. You know that also reminds me of Justin. We've told the story on our podcast before 
of when Justin and I closed down the gym back in the days and we played against the Niners, right? So we played You played, played basketball. We played though. basketball. A bunch of linemen. Like a bunch, a bunch <laughs> of line. And you could tell by the way they dribbled the ball, by the way they shot, that their skills were horrible, yet they destroyed us yeah. on the court. And it was because their level of speed for their in their size and explosivity. Yeah, yeah, it was so much at a whole different level than ours that it didn't even matter that they had a goofy looking shot or they dribbled the ball all high and weird because they were so much faster yeah. up and down the court that <laughs> yeah. we couldn't play, we couldn't keep up. That we got dominated, which is it shows you how powerful that that skill is to be able to possess. Well, I also want to, I guess, make the point too in terms of like it being anti age. Uh, oh God, I was so, just gonna go there. Yeah, because here's the thing: um, the ability to get up and move quickly is a freedom and that that you know will diminish you'll lose that ability uh and to not train it is is a way to accelerate the ability that you lose so uh to to, to train it is vital for uh, a whole host of reasons to just to be able to, to be able-bodied and to feel youthful still of all of the physical performance attributes the one that is most closely connected to youth is being able to move fast and they will talk about this all day long. You're, you lose the ability to move fast. You're aging. The, the, the cool thing about this is if you train this, you lose it at a much slower pace. You get a 60-year-old who, who don't understands how to train this way, and they do not. They move like a 30-year-old because yep. you can develop it. And you, on the flip side, you can lose this by not training it uh, as well. Next is the ability to decelerate. That sounds silly to some people who don't understand, but... That's okay. Well, slow down. Why is, is that actually a skill? Yes, it is. Oh yeah. This is a trained skill and there's a specific way to train this. This is actually one of the most anti-injury things you can yes. do is to learn how to decelerate. People hurt themselves more decelerating because they don't have the, the skill to strength to do so even more than taking off. Taking off is probably second. But slowing down, this is where injuries tend to happen. I think this 100%. is actually the most underrated attribute in athletes. I remember the first time that we got a chance to to meet and hang out with our friend Paul Fabritz. And I asked him, like, you know, train when training like these professional athletes and stuff like that, like what are like what are what are the things that like just you see and you're like there's just separate them from everyone else and this is one of the attributes mm -hmm. was their ability to decelerate right and it goes hand in hand with the the multi directional movement also right so your ability to Connected. slow down as fast as possible and then change direction and go the other direction can really separate you in in most games most games require that ability to be moving as fast as you can in one direction slow that down and change that into another direction like that ability to that that transfer of energy and under control and without injuring yourself and with complete explosion out is such a, a unique trait to be able to train and have well to use a silly example one that maybe people might have experienced if you've ever hurt your shoulder throwing a baseball at the at the field with your kids or just throwing a ball to your dog or, or whipping a frisbee and afterwards you're sore it wasn't the throwing that hurt it was the, the the lack of ability to decelerate and you probably felt it too you probably threw it and then at the end of the throw ooh my shoulder doesn't feel right it's the deceleration that you're that you're lacking and training that actually improves your acceleration a lot of people don't realize this but your body will put limiters on your performance in strength and acceleration based off of what you can slow down and stop. Right. So a lot of times athletes will improve their deceleration and what they'll notice is an improvement also in their acceleration. Next up is the ability to rotate and the ability to resist rotation known as anti-rotation. So obviously we're not robots. We're not just these, mm. you know, you know, up and down robots. We have a spine, we have a core, we're twisting and moving. In fact, uh, a, a great example of rotation, anti-rotation is walking. Mm -hmm. If you just, every time you walk, your if your left foot steps forward, it's your right hand that also moves forward. It's never the same hand, same foot. And so what's happening is a little rotation and anti-rotation control upper and lower body. When you run, it's even more powerful. That's one simple example of what we're talking about with the ability to rotate and and, and also to control. Rotation. Another good example of this, and I think everyone can, you know, I'm sure most people can remember or recall somebody who has this like in weird strength is this, they just seem so stable and solid, mm -hmm. right? They mm -hmm. can be on one leg and you try and push them and they don't They're move. Just anchored. Yeah, they, they anchored. That's a better word for it, right? They feel so anchored and mm -hmm. solid 
even in unstable environments, right? So even in an environment where they're having to balance on one leg or they're in the water or they're in these areas where they should be flopping all over the place and they still feel so anchored, it's this ability to anti-rotate and, ro and have rotational strength. And then, of course, when you see it in, in the expressions to throw a ball really right. hard or whip a pitch or throw a ball from outfield or like that. Because otherwise, let's, let's just look at a throw like that, like a pitch, and you're throwing and you're whipping this across with rotation. If I don't have the ability to anti-rotate, I'm going to go with the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Spin. laughs> my whole body's like going to go with it, right? <laughs> so it really, it, it, it just as simple as that is just being able to kind of hold your ground, anchor, uh, you know, certain parts of your body uh, and also be able to allow other parts of your body to, to move freely with rotation, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a massive value. And, and, and two, to be able to create more torque. And so this is, this is another component to be able to coil like a spring. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be able to generate even more force. Uh, and, and this is, this is a technique that, um, you know, like high performing athletes yep. have learned how to do and to be able to utilize into their mechanics. Yeah. I think of right away, I think of like a Tiger Woods golf swing. You know, uh, by the way, did you see the clip that went viral the other day of him? Uh, he was doing a driving contest with some, it looked like some buddies or no. some people that went on there. Oh yeah. So he, he did a driving contest with them. Right. And they all went up and, and did it. And then he went last and then he gets up to the ball and he gets on his knees. No. And then he out drives everybody. Out drives oh, on his wow. knees. Yes. <laughs> what a flex. On, on, on his knees. Wow. And I mean, obviously just a great, uh, obviously. I mean, that takes the power away from his lower body, but exactly. he's, he's, his rotation must have That's been what I, That was the reason why I wanted to bring that up wow. is because the, his ability to be able to rotate and generate power in, in something like that, in something as delicate as a golf swing, and then to take your legs out of it, which is insane. Wow. It's like taking a, a puncher, taking his legs out, and then expecting him well, to throw a good punch. I, I was just going to say Crazy. rotation and anti rotation for fighters. Well, obviously, this is obvious for boxers and kickboxers. Like, that's how you generate your power. Yeah. But then grapplers, the grapplers that can rotate with speed. Um, I mean, it's all about angles, right? You're taking someone down, you got to get an angle, you got to get there quickly. And that involves a lot of twisting and rotation, mm -hmm. whether it's judo, wrestling, Greco, or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, like the guys who had the core strength and stability to do this, I mean, you you combine this with grip strength and some of the other stuff we're talking about, and they're very hard to beat. By the way, th this is one of the best ways to develop an impressive core. What's funny, especially with the core, this is very interesting now, there's a lot of traditional core training exercise, and they'll develop your abs and your obliques, but I've never met somebody who trained rotation, anti-rotation, athletically. They didn't have an incredible looking core. Oh, yeah. This will develop yeah. your core muscles in ways that makes them look, I mean, they're just different. They just look amazing. All right, so let's talk about the program because we are essentially talking about components of athletic performance that, of course, athletes will benefit from and definitely the average person can benefit well, from. Well, you're also setting the table, Sal, for going over how, like, this is how we build programs, right? So this is actually a little more unique than what we normally do on these is like you're getting to peer in a little bit like this. These are the desired uh, outcomes, right? These are the attributes that we want to obtain. So when we sat down initially and said, okay, we're writing the advanced version of performance. What are the attributes that we're going to go after? Mm -hmm. And so we start there yes. and then it's now, now we build the programming around obtaining these. Well, yeah. here's, here's the, here's some of the beauty of, uh, of, of Justin's programming in this. Cause he, he really obviously contributed most of this. And what was one of the challenges we had in the past, our original mass performance program is incredible for general athletic performance. It's amazing for that. But then we would get callers and we get mail from people who are like, I'm a jujitsu guy. I'm a wrestler. I play football. I'm looking for more power. I'm looking for, you know, a harder, you know, swing at the bat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so this version of mass performance, this advanced version now includes the ability, and you'll be able to do this with the program where you can take the program and then make it specialized in power or make it specialized in rotation or make it specialized in speed or make it specialized in grip. So if you're an athlete yeah. and you know your performance and you know where you're lacking, you could take this program and then you can emphasize power, rotation, speed, or grip. And if you follow up multiple times, we can go through all, all of those, which makes it just extremely unique. Yeah. Well, I mean, at this level, right? Like we're at peak athletic performance. So that was sort of in mind, like what are your desired outcomes is to really sharpen and fine tune those skills to, a you know, a precise degree, like the principle of specificity, like applies maximally here in this program. And so that was what we were trying to achieve by, uh, really like figuring out like, what are these like, uh, four, 
types of skills that would uh, be most conducive towards like the best athletes we've seen yes. and, and how are they going to be able to maximize those skills and really fine tune, not just uh, building, developing the strength in that skill, but then also like uh, ha opening the body up mobility wise and range of motion wise and, um, you know, really prime that, that, that sequence to, to uh, promote the, the most optimal performance outcome we can. I, I'm so glad you said skill because there's, there's a skill in every exercise you do, but this really takes the skill to the next level. So not only will you develop, for example, the ability to generate power, but you'll develop the skill of developing more power. Same thing, rotation, speed, and grip. In other words, the transfer from what you get from this program to your sport or to performance is much greater than if you just picked specific exercises that worked on those things. That's the way that this is written out. If, if we break it all down, it's a, it's a three phased program. Many of our programs are phased, but phase one is really interesting. It's a triphasic phase, meaning it's broken up into three segments. Now this is pretty amazing, but the first phase focuses on eccentric contraction. So when you are lifting a weight and lowering a weight or holding a weight, there's different types of muscles contractions that we've identified and, and they do work differently in the muscle. Concentric would be lifting the weight. Eccentric is lowering the weight. Isometric is able to stabilize. And they're all very different. You could be really good at one and not so good at the others. Like to, to give an example, you think of isometric strength, you go against a jujitsu guy who, who rolls in the gi and they might not have a lot of concentric strength or eccentric strength, but when they get you in a position, you're in a vice grip, you're in mm -hmm. a lock and you can't seem to get out of it. In the contrary, someone with lots of concentric and eccentric strength might find themselves fatiguing in jujitsu positions because they can't hold a position for very long. So this phase is broken down into we're focusing on the eccentric, then the isometric, and then the concentric in, in, in specifically in that order. I heard um, a good way to describe this too in the eccentric is the ability to absorb force, right? And then also to produce the force, uh, but then control and sustain the force. Yeah. And so these are all like part of the muscle contraction process. Uh, and what we're doing with this is, is instead of just like uh, what we've built a great base, we, we have, you know, mass performance, we have, you know, maps anabolic, we have a lot of good programs that have built this strong base. Uh, in, 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 in unison. And now we're, we're peering into those very specific items that, that can benefit like the ability to absorb force. So I'm like, I'm going to hyper focus in on the eccentric part, you know, for a few weeks, and then I'm going to go over to concentric. And so this is, this is, um, th I feel like this is a really good way to be able to, um, you know, focus a bit more exclusively on those elements of what makes uh, that whole process work better. Well, I mean, all, all, all three of them are important. If you work all three of them, you're lacking kind of working on that, that, the weak link that you may have. That's why it's broken down into those triphasic. But, you know, mentioning, you know, absorbing force with standing force. I mean, the data on this is really interesting. And you showed me this and I, I looked this up and it's, I mean, it makes sense to me, but it's, it's, it's awesome that there's data to support this. Your ability to absorb force or withstand force is directly correlated to your ability to produce force. In other words, yep. because we always think about producing force, how fast I could take off or run or move. But if this is why I said earlier, when you would, when I would work with people and get them to decelerate better, they would notice improvements in their acceleration. So all of those things are intricately connected. And in phase one, you're focusing on all three of them individually. And at the end of it, you'll notice this dramatic improvement. Now, what's the logic behind the order of eccentric, isometric, then concentric in, in that order? Is it just because of the overall adaptation of the, it's easier to teach someone to slow down the process and, and decelerate basically the eccentric portion, which is a slower repetition and focus on it. Is that because it's easier and you're controlling that and then you're going into an isometric and then the last one, of the concentric portion, which is the faster part, you would say, of a of a repetition? Is that the logic behind that order? Or could somebody theoretically order those differently in the in the in the triphase? I suppose you could order it differently. I think it makes sense to me in terms of like being able to um uh, account for the load and to be able to control. That's right, I think yeah. control is really the biggest uh, uh, crucial factor in the beginning um, and, and maintaining these, these movements with 
uh, you know, uh, high effect and then going into now the expression of generating that power, that power. So I think controlling the forces, then generating the forces and then be able to sustain the forces. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because you know, the way the way my brain was going when we were putting this together and I remember you talked about breaking up the triface like that. I thought of like, like just say like a squat for an example, we'll just use that as because everybody can visualize the, that exercise and the eccentric portion is going down. And if the very first time I load somebody with that, it's like I'm a lot of the focus is like being able to control the weight on the way. Yeah. It's like familiarizing right? yourself. Yeah. With the and movement I just want you to get so comfortable with yeah. being able to take that load down. Yeah. And then at the very bottom, that's where the isometric portion of the exercise was. Now, can you stop it and be able to hold it in that position and control it? Okay, good. We've got that down. Now, can you explode out of the hole, which would be the concentric? And so yeah. that's kind of how my brain now, went in that or Like I would never skip the, 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 the eccentric portion and go right to teach you someone how to explode out of a hole. That wouldn't make logical sense. No, to me. and now right. now there, there there could be a case that could be made for isometric going first. But here's why I like uh, this order better. When you think of it from a muscle building perspective, and you look at the damage that each one of these types of contractions contributes to, we know this very clearly. Eccentric is the most damaging uh, part of a muscle contraction. It causes the most soreness, the most damaging. Second most damaging is the concentric. The last, the least damaging is isometric. So it makes perfect sense to start with eccentric, right. then go to isometric, allow a little bit of the adaptation recovery to happen, then go to the maximum exertion of power through the concentric. So it makes perfect sense to put it in that order versus starting with isometric, which you can, like I said, yeah, great, great point. You can make the case, but then I don't think that would lead to as much power generation with that last part of the phase. So phase two now, right? Now it's speed power. Now it's speed power. Yeah. Speed power is your ability to move quickly, period, yeah. end of story. This is all acceleration focus. This is, and this is, this, that's, this is a fun phase for a lot of people. Uh, it's athletes. I think I don't need to make the case. If you're an athlete, you're looking at this and you're going, oh yeah, I'm going to love this. For the average person who just likes to move well, if you never train this um, and, you, and you're fit and you're generally fit and you work out and you never train this, you are going to unlock new gains by working in this. In this. Yeah. And it's going to feel awkward at first, but well, actually not after phase one, you'll start to feel pretty regular doing this. But when you get into that speed power phase, you will unlock new gains and uh, just through performance gains. How many yeah. weeks is this phase? Sorry, Justin, cut you okay, off. Okay, good. How yeah, many weeks three. is three weeks is is the phase yep, right here, yep, yep. which is the same as phase phase one. Mm -hmm. Phase one's three. Phase two is three. Also, that's right. That's right. So, but yeah, speed power. I think uh, very easy to understand from an athletic uh, perspective. By the way, the exercises and movements we chose for this program, we looked at what is the most effective exercises, and then what is the skill acquisition required to do those exercises, and if the skill acquisition was too high, mm -hmm. then what we try to do is find a substitute. All right, so what do I mean by that? There's some very effective exercises like uh, like, a, like a, a snatch, okay? An Olympic snatch, very effective. However, if you've never trained a snatch properly, and even if you're fit, it's going to take me a year to get you to be able to do it properly before we can really load it and push it. And that's a long time, okay? So can we find a way to get that speed power with by and, and move over or skip over the skill acquisition and you can't and it's called a landmine yeah so now this this phase two the um the emphasis is on not going to fatigue mm -hmm. and, and this is a big component to that anytime because it's so explosive because we're, we're trying to pattern the best uh, movement sequence we possibly can uh we need to do this when our body's fresh and, and completely ready to go uh and so i want to put that out there because uh we've We've talked about this a lot about, especially with like box jumps and anything where we're getting into triple extension and mm. um, it, it takes uh, it, any any bit of fatigue is going to diminish um, the the type of quality of that exercise. You're that trying you're, to be powerful. You're doing. You want to be powerful and you want to be consistently doing it. Um, with with really good quality, so that way, uh, when you're when you're in competition, uh, what comes out is what you've been practicing. This so. is the most that we've ever included the landmine, isn't it? Yeah. This is more than so. this yeah. is more than any of the other programs. And I, I love that for the for the reason that you were pointing out, Sal. Is it, yeah, you it, could train speed power without without having to go through a year of learning. So yeah, and so um, yeah, the landmine uh, university uh, we. Uh, our our friend Kyle, who works in the company, actually went through their certification program, taught me a bunch of moves as well. Uh, and I've been following them and, and practicing and mimicking these movements. I, what I love about it is it just reduces the risk uh, right. substantially and also just the uh, the time it takes to learn the skill. 
Uh, and so you could do things like a, um, you know, a snatch, you can do, uh, you know, a clean, you can do a clean and jerk. And uh, all of these things are possible with the landmine uh, because of the leverage of it, it. It reduces a lot of the impact on the joints and also too. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, um, straightforward and it feels like intuitive. So it's, it doesn't feel like a, a stretch for you to learn. Yeah. 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 I do want to say real quick, it's actually four, four weeks was phase two. Phase one is, uh, six weeks. So it's two weeks, each phase or yes. each part of the tri-phase. And then the last phase is two weeks, which we're going to get to right now, which is conditioning. This is giving you a bigger gas tank. You want to be able to perform with power and speed but you want to be able to repeat it over and over again as you compete or for the average person, it's going to give you more of the kind of stamina that actually matters in the real world. Can I perform over and over again when I'm out, when I'm playing, when I'm cycling, when I'm doing whatever, that's what this phase is about. And it's a short phase because uh, you are building conditioning as you can, as you start from the program. But at the end, it's specifically like we are trying to build a bigger gas tank for this this individual. Now, the stuff that I'm more excited about is to talk about all the skill primers and yes. things like that. This yes. is what I would say is probably that makes the program the most unique. It's, is it's very we, unique. We've sort of flipped the script in terms of um, like normally we'll have like a three day schedule uh, for our foundational workouts, whereas now we do three days of just skill training and then two days of foundational type workouts. Which for the audience, you should you should know that's the direction that we were going when if you've ever heard us answer questions with athletes on the podcast, right. right? That are always asking, you yep. know, how do I lift weights? And then I'm also training for my sport and we're always encouraging them to reduce the amount of weight training, traditional weight training they're doing in the gym and increase the skills training. Nothing is going to make you better at playing soccer than playing more soccer. Nothing's going to make you better at playing basketball than playing more basketball. And what you don't want to do, which is a mistake that a lot of athletes make is they do so much of both. And then what ends up happening is is the weight room stuff that is supposed to support or accelerate your 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 progress as an athlete ends up hindering it because you're doing too much. And so that's the idea of this is that, listen, we're going to do what we need to do inside the gym, but then focusing a lot on the skills. Yeah. So in other words, two days a week would be more closely, more closely related to traditional strength training, although it's still athletic minded, right? Three days a week, you have workouts as well, but they're called skills workouts and you pick power, rotation, speed, or grip skills, strength training. You also have primers. Now, priming is what we call warming up. Now, the reason why we don't use the word warming up is because warming up is super general. Priming is much more specific. We've also included primers for people who want to focus on power, rotation, speed, yeah. or grip. So you are, this is a very focused, athletically minded program. So let's say there's a little bit of restriction in your rotation. Uh, and meanwhile, you're also doing these kind of skill workouts where you're working on strengthening that, but we need to open that up a little further. We need to get more fluid movement uh, with rotation. This is where the primers are specifically hand selected to uh, open that up for you and to enhance the abilities that you have to rotate with your shoulders, with your hips, with your spine, all that stuff. Yes. Okay. So because this is a brand new launch, um, I'll give you some of the stuff that we, we always do this when we launch a new program. We take the price, we discount it, and we throw in uh, some free stuff. So MAPS Performance Advanced. Okay. You can find it at MAPS P and the number two. So MAPS P2.com. And you can get $80 off with the launch. The code for the discount is PA Launch. So PA Launch will get you $80 off. And then here's what we've included. There's a grip strength reference guide. So that's going to be included. By the way, in that is how you can use grip strength to adjust and modify intensity of workouts. This is a replacement for a HRV, right? Yeah. You, HRV, this very is complicated. This DeFranco and Smitty's uh, go-to. Yeah. If you're a trainer, I wish I knew this as a trainer. For And then if you just for yourself, like being able to just use your grip to realize like, oh, more intensity today, less intensity. Yeah. Like, how do I know how hard to work out? This is, it's it's thrown in this Written guide. by Smitty. And it's in there for free. And then we also have a guide called Eat for Performance that talks about diet nutrition as it relates to athletic performance specifically. Of course, the program comes with a 30 day money back guarantee like all uh, of our programs. And this launch sale ends March 3rd. So again, if you go to mapsp2.com, and use the code PA Launch, you get $80 off plus two bonus guides for free the Grip Strength Reference Guide and Eat for Performance. Go check it out.